you. <laughs> thank you. Y'all, thank you very much. Please be seated. Boy, what a great group. It, you, you don't really don't see many like this. Uh, this is a great response. And, of course, and I, I'll be brief. I want to see some other parts of the program. We're, we're emphasizing today some of what the, the law enforcement aspects of this. Of course, we know it has a law enforcement aspect, strong one, but it also is a health question. It transcends everything that goes on in South Carolina. And the idea of getting the people the, who have different views of various parts of the problem, the situation, and put them, putting them together in one place where they learn each other's names, get familiar, learn about the different aspects of the problem, and learn to collaborate and communicate. I am convinced in the time that I've been in various positions and trying to get things done, that that's the secret. And often it's not there. Often everyone works in the silos and they don't talk to each other. And it might be the neighbor down the street or somebody in another town has the answer that you need, the part of the puzzle to put it together. Sarah mentioned Operation Jackpot, which was named by a reporter years ago. She said it was Holly Gatling, worked for the state newspaper. She said, y'all really hit the jackpot. How did all that happen? Well, it was collaboration and coordination. As Sarah mentioned, we knew we had a drug trafficking problem. At that time, it was hashish and marijuana coming into the state. We didn't know where it was all getting in. We knew we did not have enough law enforcement officers to ring the coastline and, and to wait out there in the middle of the night. Anybody ever been on a snipe hunt when you were a teenager? That's when they put you out there, the tricksters put you out there with a burlap sack and a flashlight and you're waiting to catch the snipe, but, but there's no snipes come as a bird, you're not going to catch any snipes. That's what the law officers often felt like trying to interdict the flow of those drugs because they were coming in from across the Atlantic and from down in the Gulf. So we put together a team, uh, a man, the head of the Criminal Investigative Division of the IRS in North Carolina came to see me. I was a young U.S. attorney, and he said, why don't we put together a group and follow the money that these people are making? They can't hide it. They don't know, everybody knows the fellow living in the biggest house in town and driving five cars and got a beach house and a mountain house, and he work, works at the dry cleaners. We know he's not making that money. He must be doing something. Let's just use that as a clue. So we put together a team that ended up with the FBI, DEA, Customs, Customs Patrol, SLED, uh, ATF and the Criminal Investigative Division of the Internal Revenue Service. First time that ever been done in the United States. Ronald Reagan asked all the U.S. attorneys to collaborate and coordinate. We formed a coordinating committee. It still exists in South Carolina. We said collaborate and coordinate, so that's what we did. And ladies and gentlemen, it was like magic. When you put all those people together, each of you a different part of the puzzle could see it from a different viewpoint, things started happening. I won't go too far into it, but just a couple of examples. We had a, had a FBI agent and a customs agent go to a Mercedes dealership in Charleston and ask, has anybody been spending more money than they can possibly be making? They said, yeah. There's a tennis pro over there to one of the country clubs. He came in the other day, said he wanted a Mercedes. We knew he couldn't afford it. We said, uh, well, well, which one would you like? And he pointed one out. He said, well, let's go to the office and maybe we can come up with a payment plan for maybe 20 years or something for, or you can pay for this vehicle. <laughs> he said, that's all right, I'll take it. And he opened up the trunk on the car he was driving and pulled out a brown paper bag, and this was in about 1979, counted out $43,500 on the hood of the car. Well, that was a clue. <laughs> he's, he's getting some money from somewhere. Fast forward a few weeks later, Customs Patrol and some other officers were patrolling one of the rivers down there around Calibogi Sound or someplace down there. And over by the edge of the water, they saw what looked like a mast of a sailboat sticking up. And they looked at it and sure enough, they could see down in the murky water, it looked like a sailboat. So they got a skin diver, went down. It was a brand new sailboat, about a 25 foot beautiful boat. The plug had been pulled to scuttle the boat. Nobody throws away a perfectly good sailboat. So they went inside and they pulled out some papers and trash in the boat. 
brought it back to the task force office. They had some beer cans and some scribblings and a few little odds and ends and put them out there and the things dried off. And as the various agents from those different agencies walked through, they'd look at that and one would say, well, it doesn't mean anything to me. The other would say, well, it doesn't mean anything to me. Thing to me. Finally, one fellow said, wait a minute, these numbers on this, they've got some directions and then it has a number. I make them up, 1906. He said, where did this come from? He said, that was in the drawer in the sailboat that was scuttled down there at uh, Hilton Head. Why? He said, well, those are the last four digits of the tennis pro's phone number. Well, had they not been working together, shoulder to shoulder, sharing ideas, sharing information, sharing insight, that never would have happened. And we ended up prosecuting, indicting, I think it was 133 people, one woman, the rest were men, most of them were college graduates. They'd never been under investigation for anything before. A couple of them had had some speeding tickets or something like that, but nothing serious. And I, I think we've eventually, I left office after four years, but I think we convicted every single one of them. But they had never been suspected of it before. We did not have the solution. We didn't know, we knew we had a problem, but we didn't know how to solve it until we got all the different people who have information and understanding together, and then we solved that problem. We indicted them, 130 something of them, convicted them, and that was four international drug organizations. They'd been getting drugs from Lebanon and all over the place. And, um, bought almost a billion dollars worth of drugs into, into South Carolina. Remarkable. That's the same thing we can do right here. With the laws that we've passed recently, and with the innovation and ideas and insight and collaborations that are going on among people in this room, we can have successes like that that we have not seen before in South Carolina, and this is a crisis just as big, perhaps even worse than that one was. The opioid crisis is killing people. It's killing people, and it doesn't need to be doing that. All kinds of people, rich people, poor people, everybody in between. And as we know, a lot of the, a lot of the drugs come out of everybody's medicine chest because they just get the, prescribed too much, but now, now medical professionals know that that's a problem. They got to stop doing that, so they are. But that only happens, that kind of understanding only happens when you get people who know what they're talking about in their area, it might be very wide, it might be very narrow. But you put them together and it's like magic, you just can't stop it. So that's what's happening here. And what my goal is, is, is to see that the talent, the ambition, the understanding, the dedication, and the love for our fellow man that we have in South Carolina leads us to the top of solutions in this country for this opioid crisis, and I believe we can do it. I know that the legislation that we have passed that has been in, inspired by you here and others who are not here today in just the last uh, couple of years is uh, leading the, the way, showing the way we're on the vanguard of solutions in this country. Sarah's so been all over, others of you have been as well, and we have more going on here, more ideas, more solutions. Many have been put into law. Others are just procedures and policies that have been adopted that are leading the way in the United States. And I want to mention a few of those before I stand down and we recognize some people. I would like to ask someone to come forward. Representative Chip Huggins is in the room. Chip, would you come up, please? This is what Chip did. He, he was the, the sponsor of the South Carolina Overdose Prevention Act, established the law enforcement officer, Naloxone, am I pronouncing that right? Training program, to date 6,600 officers have been trained. Narcan has been administered 447 times. That's 447 people who are walking around to date it would be lying down six foot under were it not for that program. Now that's significant right there and that's just the beginning. I want to congratulate everyone who's involved in that program. It's a great one, but it is a beginning. Chip, would you say something to the folks? Governor, I, I, I can't thank you enough for holding this uh, unbelievable summit. I can look out in this room and I, I just got chills. I can just tell you when I look at all of these agencies that are here, all of you that are here, it just is phenomenal. And I want to say thank you. 
from the bottom of my heart. Um, you know, I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful that House Bill 3083 was able to be passed and that those lives have been saved. But there's another person that uh, our governor and myself know very well, and his name is Representative Eric Bedingfield. Um, he was our chairman that went across the state with all of us to listen to each and every one of you with all the issues and to try to put together a package of the things that we can do to try to help. But you know what, we can't legislate this problem away. It's all of us in this room. And I'm gonna tell you something, Sarah Goldsby and Joe Shinkar, along with all of you, are to be the ones to be thanked. I'm the message carrier. I'm here for you to help you in any way that I can. I thank you for the recognition, but the most important thing, we got an unbelievable governor that's very much behind this issue, went up to Greenville to sign some bills very quickly into law, and it's helping. So keep it up. Thanks for being here today, and thank you for all you do. And as for those laws, just as a reminder, they are as follows. Is House Bill 3819, that's prescription to minors, requires that doctors speak with minors and educating them and their families before prescribing opioids. Just common sense. Well, now it's a, it's a rule, it's written down. We call them laws, but they're rules. It requires a consent form to be signed by a minor's parent or guardian after the doctor discusses the opioids that are being prescribed. Another bill, House Bill 3822, South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, must report any changes made to the schedules listing controlled substances in the addition, deletion, or rescheduling of a substance. House Bill 3826, about prescriptions, requires DHEC to develop and, the, and form a content for a counterfeit resistant prescription blank. Maybe you've seen it. You can't fake these, they're like checks. They have all the watermarks and all that on there. They must be used by practitioners for the purpose of prescribing a controlled substance. The confidentiality exceptions in one law allows DHEC to release data from the prescription monitoring program to a drug court official seeking information related to a specific case involving a designated person. Well, before we couldn't do that. Before you had people in positions of authority to do certain things that had to, had to make a ruling or make a decision without having the facts. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you have the facts, you can make the decision. It's getting the facts is the hard part. This makes that easier. Uh, House Bill 4487, controlled substances scheduling, clarifies that DHEC can continue to amend the list of controlled substances to conform to scheduling changes by the Drug Enforcement Administration, but must forward copies of the change to officials in the legislature. DHEC must post the schedules on the department's website, including the change and specifying the effective date. Next, confidentiality exceptions. It authorizes DHEC to provide da data in the prescription monitoring program to a coroner, deputy coroner, medical examiner, or deputy medical examiner involved in specific inquiry in the cause and manner of death of a designated person. Well, there again, you must make decisions, you must have the facts, and when you know what happened to this man or this woman, then you have some view as to what you may be able to do in the future. What caused this? How did it happen? House Bill 4600, opioid antidote, prescriptions to community organizations. This is a great one. I don't know how far it's reached so far, but it's allowed now and, and I, it is being done and more will be done. It adds a section to the South Carolina Opioid Prevention Act stating that a prescriber may directly or by a standing order prescribe an op opioid antidote to a community distributor for the purpose of distributing the antidote to caregivers of people who are at risk of overdosing and to people who know that they have the potential to overdose. That's very important. We're gonna save a lot of lives with that. Another one is addiction counselors. It requires people representing themselves as addiction counselors to be licensed and establishes various requirements. And finally, Senate Bill 919 establishes a seven day limit on the initial prescription of opioids, the initial prescription of opioids for acute pain management or post-operative pain management. 
exceptions are specified and include such things as cancer and hospice care. That was one of the big problems, as you know, this is not news to you, but it was, it was news to a lot of folks a few years ago. And that is, some, I, I have spoken to people myself who went in and had some sort of a procedure I said they don't want any pills. They don't like to take pills. They don't want, you know, just don't want them. Don't like them. So we we'll, we have to give you some because you might have the pain and it'd be Saturday or Sunday. Here, go and take some. And they get a bottle of 90 pills, and they might take one or two and put the rest in the, up in the bathroom. And of course, they tell us that about half the drugs that are out there came out of somebody's medicine. Yeah, that means we're all we big we drug dealers. Let's see what that means. Unwitting, and people throw them in the trash can, people break into your house. That's, that's going to save some lives right there. So that is why I said, as Chip alluded to, I think we're on the forefront. I have read and heard of no state, no state. When I say a state, I don't mean the outline on the map. I mean the people, the thinkers, the doers in this, in this place that we call South Carolina that all the explorers way back in the 15 and 1600s were writing back to their sovereign saying there's no place on earth like this place that now they call, we call South Carolina. It's the state of South Carolina, our people are thinking ahead, working together, collaborating, and no one is, going, is doing better, doing more, and doing it faster than we are in South Carolina. And I will tell you this, because of who we are, because of who we came, for, came from, where we came from, because of what all we've been through, and because most of us related to each other one way or another, we can move quicker and make decisions. We're more nimble, we're more versatile, we can communicate quicker and faster than anybody else. There's a the joke about the young lawyer starting practice out in the rural area. He said he had clients coming in, they'd say, he often would get this kind of question. They say, Mr. Lawyer, I got a question that if we married in South Carolina and divorced in Georgia, are we still cousins? You see? <laughs> Everybody knows everybody in South Carolina, and that gives us an advantage. And these industry people I talk to from around the world, from around the world, they are impressed with the people of South Carolina. They say it's a handshake state. When somebody in South Carolina gives you their word, they keep it. And that's why they're coming here, as you read about in the newspaper every time you open it up. So this is a place we're going to keep our word. We're going to keep our word to the people of this state that we're going to do whatever it takes to see to it that our state, our people, are as safe as they can possibly be made from the scourge of opioids. From the scourge of opioids. And we can do it. Thank you. Thank you for being here.